Hi, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's construction clinic which I think is the eighth in the series so if you're uh, familiar with the clinics welcome back and if you're new uh, welcome. As usual I'll be going through a housekeeping presentation, a short overview of the ICCP and then we'll introduce today's presenters and get to your questions. So on your screen, you should have a control panel. Uh, there's not too much uh, to worry about, except you'll see uh, you have a, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, you'll have a, a question box down here. So if you do have questions for our presenters today, please feel free to send them through. I only ask that you send your question through in one complete question. Uh, as we get lots of questions through, it's just easier for me to, to read out and field it across to the presenters. Um, if we send you any messages today, you'll see you have a, a, a chat icon here that will light up in orange. Um, so if you have any issues with audio, I'll drop you a message and see if I can help out. So look out for that chat box lighting up. Or if you just want to send us general messages or have any general questions for me, uh, feel free to send them through there. OK, so on to uh, the ICCP. What is the ICCP and why do we exist? Well, the ICCP is a professional members organization and we recognize those with skills, qualifications and expertise in the professional management of construction claims. We have three primary objectives and those are to establish international professional standards for the management of claims to give recognition to those who have gained appropriate knowledge and experience in the management of claims, and also to help and educate those who would like to gain that experience in the management of claims. So membership, we offer three levels, associate, member and fellow. Each level comes with a set of requirements which must be met in order to achieve membership at the desired level. Now, over the past few clinics, um, if you've joined us, we've been covering the membership in a bit more detail. But for those that weren't on those sessions, just a very brief recap. Um, when we first started the Institute, we used to only offer Route A that you'll see on your screens there. Last year, we um, introduced a route B, which essentially is your experience route. So if you look to the last requirements on your slide there, um, route A asks for a minimum member level membership of an appropriate professional institute. Route B uh, replaces that with experience. So we ask for a minimum of five years experience dealing with claims as part of general uh, job requirements or two years where the job role demanded a significant amount of your time is spent dealing with claims. If you would like to join at member level, um, we ask for uh, similar uh, prerequisites to the associate level, um, but again, on the route B option, you've got a minimum of 10 years experience dealing with claims in general, or a minimum of five years dealing with claims in detail which replaces your member level membership of a professional institute. And um, just to cover the fellow membership today for, for those the more experienced among us, um, the main issue, uh, sorry, the main requirement that I wanted to highlight today for fellow, um, again, we ask for a recognized qualification in a construction industry subject. We also ask for a minimum of member level membership of a, an appropriate professional institute that is required for fellow level. There's, there's, there's not an alternative uh, for that requirement at fellow level. Then we ask for your minimum uh, 20 years experience working in the construction industry and either a minimum of 10 years experience dealing with claims as part of general job requirements or a minimum of five years where the role demanded a significant amount of time was spent dealing with claims. One thing I'd like to highlight with Fellow, unlike other institutes, we don't increase our fees uh, for Fellow level. It's kept to the £260, which is the same as member. What we do ask, however, is that Fellows give back. So uh, that might be through presenting a member's webinar, it might be providing a written paper or articles for our members' knowledge base. Um, it could be um, contributing to our newsletter articles. 
um, mentoring some of our junior members um, through the mentoring scheme. So we ask you to commit to the Institute and, and share your knowledge with more junior members. So if any of that in, uh, appeals to you and you'd like to learn more, you can go to the ICCP website. Um, you can also contact me. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. And if you'd like to go ahead with a, a, a formal application or just get some advice on where you might sit in those levels, uh, you can drop an email to the membership team. OK, so on to today's panelists. Uh, we're delighted to welcome back Andy Hewitt. Andy is a FIDIC contracts and claims expert. He's also the author of a couple of books and he's also our ICCP fellow and executive officer. Andy's joined by Lee Spall. Lee is a planning and delay analysis expert. He's also an ICCP fellow and one of our new steering committee members. Please, if you're sending questions in today, try to make sure that they fit Andy and Lee's areas of expertise. Um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Right, so on to the clinic, and I believe Andy is going to kick things off for us today. Yeah, thank you, Nina. I'd, I'd just like to uh, just just pick up on one of, one of the things that Nina was stressing today. She was talking about the, the fellow membership of the ICCP. Uh, I, I also happen to be a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Building and uh, quite a few years ago now when I was awarded my fellowship, uh, which, which was at uh, an evening dinner and presentation, uh, the person making the uh, presenting the awards <coughs> actually said that achieving a fellowship in the sort of institute that was the Chartered Institute of Building, and I would like to think the ICCP is also, is the equivalent of a doctorate from university. And I think that's the level that we want to be aspiring for <clears throat> to become uh, a, a fellow with the, within the Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners. So if you're a fellow, you know your stuff, basically. So uh, onto the clinic. Uh, firstly, Dinush, the, sorry, Dinushika, uh, has sent not one question, but about 10 questions. And I'm going to be sending you a fee invoice, Dinushka, for, for all of these. But nevertheless, it's an interesting uh, case study. Uh, it relates to the FIDIC uh, suite of contracts, and it's actually the silver book. Uh, I will try to skip through it and, and give you the, uh, the, uh, the, the details of it. Now, due to COVID-19, our project is suspended. Initially, the employer informed us that they ceased all inspections and later a result of conversations held, it led to suspension because without receiving any approvals subject to inspections, the contractor is unable to continue with the project. So I see here, it's a, it's a life project. The engineer or the supervising consultant needs to approve the works by inspection process and also there needs to be shop drawing submittals that need to be approved, material submittals that need to be approved, et cetera, et cetera. And the employer and his consultants is not doing that anymore because of COVID. Let me go on. Uh, since we did not have a written instruction to suspend, we, the contractor, issued a letter informing the employer that the project had been suspended upon their instructions. Well, there were no instructions to suspend, so the contractor's got no right to suspend. In the same letter, we informed of our intention to claim an extension of time and or additional costs due to the suspension, and later we also issued a notice of claim as point 20.1, close 20.1. Now, if we look at the FIDIC, the only uh, option for the contractor to suspend is if the employer doesn't pay them and that's after giving a 21 day notice. Only the engineer can instruct suspension in the FIDIC defined uh, uh, definition. And this is not actually suspension. It's actually a delay caused by the failure of the employer and his consultants 
to do their job, whatever the reasons. It happens to be COVID-19. So it's a failure to issue instructions, directions, etc., etc. The contractor has been delayed because of those, uh, the lack of those instructions. He obviously can't concrete without the requisite inspection, etc., etc. Uh, so this is not actually a suspension. So the notice that the contractor sent in this case was incorrect. It's not. It's not suspension. He should have sent. For those of you that are familiar with FIDIC, uh, a 1.9 notice, which is failure to issue drawings or instructions, and firstly give a notice that delay was being uh, suffered and the contractor was incurring costs through having people stood about doing nothing. And then secondly, give a notice under clause 20.1 that the contractor intends to make a claim. So. We've not even got onto the question yet, I'm sorry. Uh, so going on, as per clause 8.9, which is the suspension clause, which states that after receiving the notice, the employer shall proceed in accordance with subclause 3.5 to agree or determine the matters. Well, that clause is the wrong clause. It's not a suspension. It's a delay caused by what we've just said. Should the employer communicate in writing to the contractor if there is any disagreement to the issued notice? Now, a notice should be a, a, a simple statement of fact, so there can be nothing to disagree with. Dear Mr. Employer, no suspensions are taking place. You're not responding to our materials approval or our shop drawing submittals. We are therefore suffering delay and incurring costs, full stop. The employer cannot disagree with that, so there's nothing to respond to. I once worked on a project, it was a hospital project, where the, the employer had reduced the 28-day notice of claim period to seven days. The contractor wasn't stupid, so whatever happened on that project, we got a notice. And the employer, I was working for the PMC consultant as the contract's manager, was saying, Andy, reject this notice, reject this notice. We're getting all these notices, reject them. And I said, I can't reject something that the contract says the contractor is obliged to submit. The time to argue with it is when we've received the claim. So going on, is there a specific time for the above? Well, this is, should the uh, employer respond? Well, the employer, if you've written your notice correctly, uh, it won't elicit a respond. Uh, going on with the project, two weeks after seizing the inspections, uh, the employer requested to suspend works, which he didn't, I don't think. After the contractor issued a notice of claim, quoting subclause 8.9, wrong clause, and 20.1, the employer is now saying that they didn't mean to suspend the works. Well, they didn't suspend the works, if I'm reading the, uh, the, 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 uh, the case correctly, and only meant to seize inspections. Well, sounds like that's what they did. Uh, da, da, da. And he's also asking the contractor under which subclause the contractor wishes to claim, whether it's under 19.4, which is force majeure, or 8.9. We've already said that 8.9 suspension is the wrong clause anyway. <clears throat> uh, the employer is saying that every action should be under 19.4 force majeure so that financial claims would be avoided. Well, of course he is. If we actually look at FIDIC, clause 8.4 extensions of time gave, gives you entitlement to an extension of time if for a epidemic which delays the project. I think we can argue that the lack of inspections and responses to submittals were caused by COVID-19. So I think you can tick that box, but you've not quoted that clause. Clause 1.9, which, which is failure of the employer to issue drawings or instructions when they needed, gives you entitlement to claim for, for time and cost. So if I was the contractor, that's the clause that I would be relying on. Finally, please advise how the contractor should react in such a situation. Well, 
I'm going to be a little bit cynical here, uh, Dunashika. Firstly, make sure you understand cause and effect. This is not a suspension. This was the employer and his agents, i.e. the engineer, uh, not doing their job. Doesn't matter what the reasons were, they were not doing their job. Make sure you understand the contract so that when you do submit notices, you submit the right notices and they contain the right information and make sure that you submit the correct notices. Now, how would you get out of this? Well, I would try to ignore the fact that you've submitted the wrong notices when you submit your claim and in your claim, demonstrate your entitlement to time and or costs by using the correct clauses. Now, I don't wish to <laughs> embarrass Dinoshika or his, his employers, the contractor, but this is a fairly typical case study of, of something that we see all the time. And my other job is I am a consultant offering commercial contracts and claims dispute advice. And unfortunately, contractors do not understand the contract. Could be fitty, could any contract. They don't understand it. They don't understand what their obligations are. They don't understand when they are submitting something as important as a notice to do it under the right clause to put the right information in it and they get themselves in a mess now we always advise our clients get us on board if you don't have anybody on your project that knows the contract inside out upside down and backwards get somebody like us on board early because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we can, in a couple of, of, of hours, advise a contractor, what's the clause, how to draft your notice, even draft it on their behalf, and make sure you're not going down the wrong route. And that prevents the claim being rejected. If you put your claim in, in based on the wrong clause, the engineer will be quite within his rights to say, you don't have entitlement because we didn't instruct you to suspend. You can't turn what we didn't do into a claimable event. Now, then it gets to, oh, well, we think we're entitled, but the engineers rejected it, quite rightly, in my opinion, we'll have a dispute. Come on, the lawyers, bring all your, all, all your lawyers and, and your, your high bills and buy yourself another Porsche. Let's go to dispute. We'll get let some arbitrators in and some judges and expert witnesses all of a sudden, you're five years down the line, you've spent half a million dollars on something that you've spent a couple of hundred dollars five years earlier, you wouldn't have to do. Now, my, my ex-colleague, friend and fellow steering committee member with the ICCP, Lee, is online. He also works for a large international uh, consultancy and I'd just like to hear his, his opinion from many years of experience on what we just talked about there. Um, I agree with everything you said, Andy. Um, so many times we get called onto projects where the problem could be resolved very quickly if the people understood what they were looking at. I mean, I'm dealing with the time on all the projects I look at. And, you know, I mean, you've just said, the, the employer said he's not going to carry out the inspections. Okay, well, straight away, there's your calls. Now, what's the effect on the program? And that's an 8.4E, where is the employer's causing impediment? So it was, it's that simple. Um, but it's so, so much emotion is normally put into this, where you're on that job, you fall out with the client, you don't like what he's saying, you don't like what the engineer is saying, you feel like you're being treated unjustly. And so you just, exaggerate everything and you're going to lose so as andy said spend that money wisely and you'll get the right result okay thank you lee uh, <laughs> glad, glad you agreed with me you could have been uh, could have been embarrassing otherwise but yeah i mean it's it, it frustrates us because uh, we we tend to get involved when the disputes crystallized or when the contractor's dug himself a big hole and, and you know really 
what what Lee said is it is that simple. It is that simple if you understand the the contract. It really is. If you don't understand it, or you've got no one on your project that understands it, upside down, inside out, uh, inside out and backwards, it's not simple. It's difficult. And and there's a good uh, example of it. So uh, moving on to Dinashika's question number two, which is about uh financing charges for delayed payment fidic allows the contractor to claim for financing charges if the employer delays the uh the, the payment of the interim payment certificates and his question is we've got a project that is the payments are made in us dollars and fidic says uh the financing charges should be calculated based on the discount rate of the central bank in the country of payment. Danushka's question is, is that should that be the USA? Well, the currency is dollars, a US dollars, so yes, it would be the uh, the central bank in the USA. Uh, and then a second question: sometimes the rate varies varies within a month. In such situations, which rate should be used? Should you average it or should we calculate each section separately? Well, if you've got 10 days at this percentage and four days at this percentage, that would be the correct way. But in real terms, it's going to make very little difference to the amount of financing charges that you will be claiming. So really, uh, it's one of those things that you could argue about well, the principles for six months uh, and it's going to make a couple of hundred dollars difference whichever way you do it. So go for the cheapest one and uh, hopefully you'll get you'll get your deal if you're a contractor. Uh, moving on to my next question from our friend Simon Rowlands who seems to be a bit of a fan of, her, of us. Uh, is a Fiddick Red Book. <clears throat> the contractor has chosen to engage the majority of its suppliers and subcontractors from overseas. That's the contractor's option. Most could have been engaged within the country, but the contractor elected not to do so. Let's just stick, take a moment here and think. The contractor did it for a reason, probably because he could do it either more efficiently or cheaper by bringing in overseas contractors. So the employer gained an advantage. Most likely the contractor got the uh, the award of the contract because he, his price was competitive or more, more likely than not lower than anybody else's. So we've got to go with the contractor's modus operandi. Going on with Simon's question, the impact of COVID-19 has had a very significant effect on this overseas supply chain and is continuing, but within the country, the COVID-19 impact is minimal. This is a tricky one. Well, it's not tricky. It's a bit like Lee said. It's actually quite simple, but you can get yourself led down the path of it being complicated. Whose risk is it? And is the employer liable to pay for any time and cost impact under the contract? So clause 8.4, extensions of time in FIDIC, allows for an extension of time in a case of a mass epidemic to the extent that the delays uh, delay the time for completion. COVID-19 is obviously a mass epidemic, so there's your entitlement to claim for an extension of time. The fact that the supply chain was in a country that was affected heavily by COVID-19 is, 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 is a red herring the contractor was delayed due to a, a, a mass epidemic, therefore is entitled to an extension of time. For costs, well, we've talked about this before and this, there is a paper available to ICCP members. In order to claim costs, we've got to look at force majeure. And as I've said before, it's not certain that force majeure is applicable to COVID-19 and I'm not going to go into the, the, the reasons again uh, but FIDIC is a little bit explicit it says if the force majeure event happens outside the country which it does in this case uh, costs aren't going to be claimable so Simon I hope that answers your questions and that's me finished 
So I'd like to hand over to Lee. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, right, I've got uh, two questions. First one is from, okay, pronunciation, here we go. Gimichu Kinati. Um, and the question is, if a delay is justified, at what time is it justified? Is it at the end of the original completion period or at the occurrence of the delay? So justified, I assume you mean it's actually approved, accepted, and that the delay is valid. Um, so is it just if, what time is it justified? Well, the delay occurs when it occurs. So that's the delay period. Um, if it's critical, then the effect of that will delay your project completion. If it's non-critical, it will be a delay just in that area. So then there won't be a delay to your project completion. So um, what time is it justified? It's at the time the event occurs. But that could lead to a delay in your project completion. So then that's the project completion. Um, I hope that answers it because the question's a little bit vague and what time is it justified? Um, but the delay is when it occurs and you analyze when the delay occurred and any costs associated will be at that time. Okay, um, but if not, then please contact us and we'll try and answer you. The next question I have is from uh, Jay Pr Prakash, um, and his question is, if the rate of progress is slow and the contractor cannot complete on time, as per sub clause 8.6, a recovery program shall be submitted. Second part then says that the SCL states it is a contractor's obligation to mitigate the delays. If the contractor demonstrates that even after the mitigation adopting techniques like fast tracking and parallel sequencing, it is not possible to complete on time, what program should be submitted? Should it be an EOT submission? Okay, so the progress is slow, 8.6 recovery, and we still can't make time for completion. So it can't then be a true recovery program under the contract because you can't meet time for completion if it's defined in the contract. So it would be a best effort program. However, the rate of slow progress could be a combination of either the contractor's delays, 100%, it could be the employer's delays, 100%, or it could be a mixture, both contractor and employer. So if it's the contractor delay, then yes, best effort program, mitigation, acceleration, that's the best you're gonna do. And any damages that are gonna come or penalties, then that's what you're gonna be liable for. If it's purely 100% the contractor's issue. If it's the employer's issue, then my recommendation would be to try and do an 8.6 to show that you've tried to mitigate. Now this never happens with contractors, but by doing that, you're showing what you can try to do to mitigate some of the delays. And then for the remainder, put the EOT in and get that EOT. Your more chances of getting that through and winning it quite quickly because you've shown that you've, you've tried to mitigate. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the time, the contractor would just go for the entire period under an EOT claim. If it's a mixture, um, I would do the same thing. I would try to mitigate as best I can, put an EOT claim in. And for the part that I can't mitigate, um, then that's going to be down to you. So you would suffer a delay. So 8.6 um, doesn't work if you can't meet time for completion, if that's what your contract states that the 8.3 program is for, it has to meet time for completion. 8.6, if you can't, if you've gone so far down the road on the project and it's impossible to achieve the end date, then an 8.6 won't be a recovery unless there's an a revised completion date. So it would be a best effort program. And then the combinations of whether it's contracted delay, employer delay, or a combination of both. Um, it's always interesting that, just to throw in before I finish, 
that if you have to mitigate something um, because it is going to be your delay, work out what the cost of that mitigation, maybe acceleration, double shifting, nighttime working. What's the cost of that compared to the delay cost that you're going to be levied against? Um, if it's cheaper to go and do the acceleration measures at your cost, then do it or take full damages and lose a reputation with the client. Um, I think that one definitely is answered. Um, so yeah, that's it, me, Nina, I'm over. Um, back to you, now to the, um, the hot seat. Thank Nina, you, before, before you uh, just close out, I'd just like to pick on something that, forgive me for stealing your thunder there, Lee, but again, this oh. is another case study that, that we find all the time is on a typical project because and i'm going to go back to it contractor doesn't understand his obligations or doesn't have anybody on the project that understands the contract doesn't want to put the money into contract management or contract administration delays happen on the contract contractor doesn't submit his notices contractor doesn't submit his claims so nothing happens we've still got the original time for completion it then after several months approaching the project end everybody realizes that we're not going to meet the time of completion the engineer does his job and says mr contractor you need to submit a program to show us how you're going to recover the delays which are all your fault because you haven't submitted an extension of time so we want a recovery program now at this point the contractor starts going <laughs> We shouldn't be doing this. We've got extensions of time. We've been delayed. And they phone Leo or Andy up or another consultant up and say, well, we're in a big mess. Can you help us? Well, yes, we can help you. But it would have been better to help you right at the beginning and help you to put your claims in six <coughs> months ago, one year ago, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sorry to bang on about this. But again, it's stuff that we deal with see all the time and can be avoided at very without spend, without spending a lot of money to dig you out of the hole so that's all i wanted to say just to underline it again and uh, sorry back to nina <laughs> thanks andy um we do actually have um uh we started a little bit late today and we've got a couple of questions in so um i'm just going to field one across to you um it's short and sharp which we like um, so the question comes from uh, Sham Raj, who asks, um, firstly, they're using the FIDIC Red Book, I'm assuming it's 1999. Um, the client requests us to amend our claim to match what is certified before we can be paid. Surely our claim is our claim and we should not be forced to amend to suit the client. Your thoughts? Shall I take this one, Lee? You go, you go. <laughs> this doesn't only happen with claims, it even happens when engineers try to make the contractor amend their interim payment application. We don't agree with it, therefore revise it and resubmit it for the figure that we're going to pay you. No, no, no. The reason we don't do it on a interim payment certificate is that providing you're not cheating and asking for too much, or you made a genuine mistake, <clears throat> is our uh, interim payment application is what we believe should be paid, including payment for variations and claims that we've submitted. If you disagree with it, Mr. Engineer, you have to reevaluate it and issue your interim payment certificate accordingly. I am not going to revise and resubmit it because you have a different opinion. And it's exactly the same with claims. Unless the engineer convinces you that your claim is incorrect, and the engineer has got to convince you by giving you a detailed response to your claim, not by just saying your claim is rejected, full stop, or we think it's worth 30 days instead of 130 days, full stop. Unless the engineer can convince you that you are wrong and he is correct, do not revise your claim and go further than that and write a letter and say, we don't agree with your opinion, Mr. Engineer. And probably, by the way, 
you haven't consulted with us in, a, in an attempt to reach agreement, which is your obligation, and you haven't given detailed comments with your rejection, which is another obligation. So contractors, don't let engineers bully you, write them a nice letter saying we disagree and get it recorded, because that will be important if the matter elevates to a dispute. Yep, I've got nothing hey. to add to that. <clears throat> Right, well, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of notes before we close out. Um, I see we've got quite a few members on the session today. Um, in case you missed them, the members webinars, we did two recently, claims and international adjudication and um, what to do in periods of suspension or delay due to COVID-19. Both of those are up in the members area now. So uh, if you missed them, check out the recordings. Uh, for any non-members, if you've missed any of the construction clinics, that all the recordings are up on the ICCP website. So go back, have a listen. Um, you'll also find the series of public webinars that we did um, sort of strad straddling 2019-2020. There was a series of six public sessions, so check those out as well. Um, and thank you very much for joining today. Thank you to Andy and to Lee. And if you have any questions about the ICCP or we can help you in any way, drop me a line and I'll get in touch. Thank you, everybody, and we hope to see Thanks you next week. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.